So why does God allow mankind to suffer? This is one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult question in all of theology. It's been called atheism's most potent weapon against the Christian faith. You know, if God is eternal, if he's omnipotent, omnipresent, why does he allow these atrocities to go on? Or even if there is a God, why does he allow mankind to suffer? If God is so loving and merciful, why does he allow this, that, or the other thing to happen? You know, the children to die, or even the, you know, the innocent, we can put that in quotes, the innocent to die. Why does he allow people to starve? diseases to propagate, different modalities of pain to persist. You know, he's the all-powerful, all-knowing God that everybody has come to believe in. So why doesn't he intervene? Why doesn't he intervene in wars, famine, pestilence, sickness? Is it because he's this capricious God that some religions believe in? One that's just kind of does whatever he wants, whenever he wants, for no apparent reason? Or is it that he's just not involved in the affairs of mankind? Of course, that's not what Christians believe. They believe that he is involved. So there is a reason that this is one of the most asked for uh, booklets or questions in the Church of God. You know, you would, I don't know what you would think is the most asked for, but, you know, some this might come as a surprise sometimes. <laughs> You know, I would tend to believe it might be <coughs> prophecy. You know, people want to know what's going to happen in the future. But this is the one question that most people are not able to reconcile. They don't have an answer to. And yet the Bible exactly does tell us why, whenever you search it a little bit here and a little bit there. I want to read this reply by a learned priest to, you know, exemplify what I'm talking about. Someone had asked him a similar question. This is something that I took off the internet. The person says, sometimes I get so frustrated that I look up at the sky and ask, Lord, do you still work for a living? Why can't you do something? Is a little humane treatment for my daughter by her peers too much to ask? She was being bullied. And this is, you know, I, I would imagine <coughs> this sentiment is echoed by quite a few people. Whenever they, they think about God and they see all these things that we've been talking about, and especially when it comes to home here to roost with their own daughter being bullied. Well, the priest, who was entrusted with the answer by this person, says, In short, Mr. Weaver, I know and share your feelings of frustration with divine providence. Often, I just cannot figure out what our allegedly merciful Lord is up to. It does not make much sense to me, and it makes me really angry at times. And even when I look at the Bible, I'm in good company. They couldn't always figure out God either. Even Jesus felt that way on the cross. So what is God up to when he permits innocent people to suffer? This prolonged, grinding misery, these prayerful appeals to his mercy, they seem to fall on deaf ears. I honestly don't know. So this is what a priest, you know, somebody who's supposedly educated in this arena, who has, you know, answered questions like this, or you would think been uh, posed questions like this in the in the past. Why is it, you know, that he doesn't know, or why is it that this is his answer? And it really comes across as a very abiblical and unchristian answer in many respects when he the way he says it. So I'm, you got to wonder, well. You know, what's going on here? Well, the thing is, he's actually in good company. Here's what Pope Benedict, the, uh, the former uh, Pope, uh, had to say as well. This is from a USA Today article. And most of the questions grapple with suffering. The first question posed came from Elena, a Japanese girl who told the Pope many children her age were killed and asked, and asked why children have to be so sad. He said... I also have the same questions. This is the Pope, the leader of the, the you know, basically the Christian world. You know, when you look at the, the religious leaders of the world, you know, the Pope's right up there for in terms of Christianity, even though 
people don't believe he's, you know, the head of their particular, you know, Protestant faith or whatnot. But nonetheless, most people look at him as being the top dog, as it were. I also have the same questions as the, the little Japanese girl. He hasn't reconciled this in his mind yet. Why is it this way? Why do you have to suffer so much while others live in ease? Benedict said. And we do not have the answers, but we know that Jesus suffered as you do, an innocent. So he doesn't have the answers either. So it makes you wonder sometimes, you know, how much people are indeed reading the Bible. So we need to begin first with why the world is in the state that it is in. Let's turn to Galatians 6. Galatians 6 and verses 6 and 7. Galatians 6, verses 6 and 7. It didn't just get this way. It didn't just start this way. It became this way because of a simple principle. And we find it here in Galatians 6, beginning in verse 6. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. This is one of the main reasons for the state of the world. It is cause and effect. It is what the world, in effect, has been sowing. And the state of the world now is this direct effect of this. It's what they are now reaping. You know, look at some of the, the health issues that face mankind at the moment. They come from poor choices. And this is one of the reasons the world's in the state of it's in, that it is in. It is founded on poor choices. You know, we, we look at accidents and motor vehicle crashes are one of the leading causes of fatalities among young men. You know, to stay safe on the road, we need to use common sense, which isn't always that common. But you need to wear your seat belt. You need to follow the speed limit. You don't drive under the influence of alcohol or any other substances. You don't drive when you're sleepy or distracted. You know, th these are the causes of what the, you know, what's, uh, you know, called as poor choices. These poor choices are leading to what? These fatal accidents. You look at smoking, uh, chronic lung diseases, which include lung can cancer, emphysema, COPD, bronchitis, STDs. Another poor choice. You know, abstinence would pretty much put all that to a, a grinding halt. Obesity. Uh, excess body fat is one of the most common medical conditions in the United States, and it can reduce life expectancy by several years and lead to other problems. Heart disease goes hand in hand with, with obesity. So the point here isn't necessarily to lecture about diet and exercise, but to show causation, show that choices, poor choices, lead to all these effects, these outcomes that we're seeing around us. Now, we're just talking about some health issues. You know, what about all the other issues? It's the same story. It's the poor choices that people are making that are causing the self-inflicted problems that we have today. So whenever we look around and we see the things that we've been talking about and mentioning, quote unquote, the God's not intervening on at the moment, and you say, okay, well, why is it that it's this way? Well, one of the main reasons is that we reap what we sow. Another reason for the state of the world that we have right now is that people are not content. They're not content with what they have. They're not content with their, their situation. Let's look at Philippians 4.11. Philippians 4.11, and we'll read verse 12 as well. We're talking about why the world is in the condition it's in. It's because of lack of contentment. Notice what Paul says here in Philippians 4, in verse 11. He goes, not that I speak in regard to need. Now, Paul is, when he's saying this, he's saying the state that he's in, he doesn't necessarily need to be in. He had the ability to be in another state. You know, he wasn't confined to this because of certain poor choices. But he's also saying that okay, I'm wherever I'm at right now, I have learned in whatever state that I am to be content. 
So he had learned this to be content. It's a, a learned uh, uh, process. It's a, it's a learning process that you go through in terms of learning to be content. He says, I know how to be a base. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So he's just saying that he has come to the point, and he's, of course, his admonishment is to Christians, to Christianity, is that whenever you find yourself in any state, you're, you should be content with it. And that is not what we're seeing right now in the world. Man gets into trouble when he's not happy with his current state. For whatever reason, he's looking around, he's seeing other people, and perhaps coveting other things, or bemoaning that this, the state he is in, whether it's because of poor choices or whatnot. And he's saying, okay, I, I need to uh, go out and I need to, because of selfish reasons, I need to get these other things. I need to do these other things. I can't be right here. And so it leads to things such as, as <coughs> stealing, uh, libel, slander, killing. And, and these continue to bring problems on themselves because of this selfish nature that people have. So it's counterproductive to peace to not be content whenever you have to have somebody else's thing because yours is not enough, yours is not green enough, it's not big enough, it's not warm enough, whatever it is. These are the reasons that people are you know, getting themselves into trouble because they're not content with what they have. And the world is also in the condition it is in because when you get a whole bunch of people in a specific area and they all start acting in this specific way, these ways that we're talking about, it has the ability to adversely affect you more quickly and even more effectively. So the, what I'm saying is that these problems, because everybody's doing them, tend to propagate even more abundantly around us because there's more people. It's not just uh, you and your own poor choices and your own lack of contentment. Now everybody's doing it. And it can't help but have a, a negative effect. Let's turn to James 4. Verses 1 and 2. You know, people act like those people that are around them. And when they do it in a collective manner, it just is so much more, quote unquote, effective than when you just, you know, have one person that you have to withstand. James 4, verses 1 and 2 says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and you covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. Leaders and evil men will, because of their covetous reasons, lead willing men to war to try to take what they want. And all of a sudden it becomes easier. And we've even seen this you know, in the church of God. That in the past, you know, we've always had a very firm stance about what we do for war. But now, all of a sudden, people are saying, well, okay, it's okay to go to war. It's okay to kill people if it's a justifiable war, if it's a quote-unquote righteous war. And they start reasoning these things because, you know, the influence from around them. And they're coming to conclusions that the Bible does not lead to. You know, we're familiar with tyrants and dictators throughout history. And their motives have always been these things like greed and power and envy, the more base aspects of our human nature. And the repercussions of war then in turn can lead to all these other things that we're talking about, the, the death, the famine, the disease, many of the things that we see today. So these are the, you know, some of the reasons, and these are probably more of the ancillary reasons as to why the world's in the condition it is. But there's one main reason that it is the way it is today, and this is what we've been building up to, and it's the real cause of the problems that we're seeing around us and for the reasons of the state of the world. And that is because of Satan and his demons and the influence that they had. Satan is the god of this world. He's called the god of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He rules from his throne right here on earth. That's what Revelation 2.13 says. He and his demons are the current rulers of this world. They are the ones that are, quote-unquote, in charge. Ephesians 6, verse 12, 
I'll read this one for you. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This is not who our fight is really against. So whenever we, we talked about these poor choices and people not being content and the, the masses of people acting all adversely to you know God's way all around us and how, how that makes it difficult, all these stem from this, from Satan and his demons. So we're not actually wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of darkness of this age, or of this world, as the King James puts it, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That is who the world, whether they realize it or not, or know it or not, is wrestling against. It's not always, or solely, or even primarily, the other ones that we've been talking about. Satan deceives the whole world. That's Revelation 12, verse 9. Not just some of the world, but the whole world. And we can even count ourselves among this, even though we may be uh, more in tune with these things and know that these things are going on. Satan would love nothing more than to deceive those who have the truth of God, more so than even the rest of the world. Where's the necessity to fool those who are already fooled? We can continue to keep them in darkness, but even more so those who are in the light. John 8 and verse 44. Turn there if you'd like. It's just one verse. We'll read. A little bit longer, so I'll let you give you a little time to turn there to the one verse. But let's look at what Christ said to the Pharisees in John 8 and verse 44. I'm sure they didn't like this too much. But he said, You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. What are those things? What, what is it that you desire because you're not content with your current state? What is it that you're willing to now make a poor choice about? He, being Satan, was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. Now he's a murderer because that's what he inspires in people from the very beginning with Cain when he inspired him to kill Abel. You know, that was not a godly thing. There was nothing that God had, had done or said that would have provoked Cain to do this. But Satan has that power, not only to influ influence Cain, somebody who I'm sure was naive in many respects, but he has a, the power to influence whole groups of people to go to war, whole bodies, nations to go to war and to do the things that we're talking about here. Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14. Satan has always done this, is currently doing this, and will again do it in the future. So what we're seeing is the world has always been this way, is this way, and will continue to persist as long as Satan is there and people are yielding to his power. Revelation 16, 13 it says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. He has the ability, the devil, to inspire wrong doings through the spirit of error that 1 John 4, 6 talks about. Ephesians 2, 2, again, goes always, to me, always goes hand in hand with 2 Corinthians 4, 4, but it talks about another part of his domain. He says, in which, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. This is talking about the way that we used to walk, what we used to be a part of. According to the prince of the power of the air. That's who we were influenced by. This person who works in the power of the air. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And so he's talking about this is the influence to make people 
disobedient. It's his power. Uh, Herbert Armstrong put it this way. I'll read a quote. The spirit in every human being is automatically tuned in on sa Satan's wavelength. You don't hear anything because he does not broadcast in words, nor in sounds, whether music or otherwise. He broadcasts in attitudes. He broadcasts in attitudes of self-centeredness, lust, greed, vanity, jealousy, envy, resentment, competition, strife, bitterness, and hate. In a word, the selfishness, hostility, deceitfulness, wickedness, rebellion, etc., that we call human nature is actually Satan's nature. It is Satan's attitude. And broadcasting it, surcharging the air with it, Satan actually now works in the unsuspecting all over the world today. That's how Satan deceives the whole world today. Being invisible, Satan is not seen by people. So, you know, what is it they say about Satan that the, the greatest lie he's ever told is to make everybody believe that he doesn't exist? So, you know, of course, I know what people are going to think when they hear this. You know, they're going to think that it's you know, fantasy. But yet, there, this is reality. It's more real even than the physical world is. So it's by this means that Satan is able to hold the whole world captive and under his sway. 2 Timothy 2.26 says something along those lines. And it has been this way ever since the very beginning. Satan predates mankind. Let's look at this, the, this first bad decision that was made by humans in Genesis 2 and verse 9. And notice for the purpose of noticing how Satan works. Genesis 2 and verse 9, we'll skip around a little bit through uh, the first couple of chapters of Genesis here. Genesis 2 and verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow, that is, pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the two trees. Verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. So God told man that he could eat from anything even the tree of life. Had he done that, had he eaten from the tree of life and received the Holy Spirit and the power of God and all that comes with it, the understanding, is what would have happened. He, had he had done that, he could have avoided the problems that were, you know, that most of us are facing today, the ones that, again, we've been talking about. Verse 17, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. So he, he said in the previous verse, Every tree, all the trees that we have made. I mean, can you imagine? You know, I mean, all the stuff that we would love to have that would have been, you know, the perfect creation, the things that we try to make grow that don't grow. They had all these things. They had everything that they needed, plus more, I'm sure. And God said, you can have everything except just I want you to give this one tree. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So the God, the creator, the maker of the trees is telling them how things are, the way that he made it and what he wanted them to do. In verse 18, and the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable to him. So he made the wife, Eve. And then verse 25, And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. <coughs> so again, we're getting a, a lay of the land to see how things were. Now continuing in chapter 3, verse 1, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, this is the serpent, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? He knew what God had said. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said you shall not eat. You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, 
lest you die. So it was clear to her, even at this point. At this point, neither Adam or nor Eve had shown any predisposition for going against the ways that they were instructed in by God. What we talked about here in Genesis 2 and 3. I mean, 3 verses 2 and 3. Now, verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, okay, now remember the context that we're reading this in, see how Satan works and what he does. He goes, you will not surely die. So all of a sudden, you know, here it is, God's told them everything. They have no reason not to believe God. But then the serpent says, okay, no, 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 that's not true. And he lies to them. And goes on and says, for God knows, he goes to sell it a little bit here. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So we notice then that after the creation of man and woman, and up until Genesis 3 and verse 6, there's no indication of this wrongful human nature that we talk about today. Verse 6, so when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, as the serpent told her, she took of the fruit and ate it. And she also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. So what is it that changed and brought about man's sin, the first sin here? In the beginning of Genesis 3, there's this un introduction of an ungodly influence, a serpent, who we know is none other than Satan the devil. And he not by force works on Eve, but he begins to work her over with words, with lies, with, you know, saying, hey, you know, really, do you need to be content with and he just, you know, having all those trees except this one, or should you really have this one as well? And so he goads her into making a poor choice and taking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God explicitly told them not to eat from. So after eating of the tree and giving some of the fruit to Adam, of which he ate also, a change happens. Verse 7, the eyes of both of them were opened. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So they began to act differently. They now hid. Remember we read before that you know, they weren't ashamed, but now they hid their nakedness from the Creator. This was not an issue before. The change in their nature and the way that they acted happened when they chose to follow Satan and to reject or rebel against God and what God had told them. So are we seeing how the, this change happens? Are we seeing how Satan works? How he influences mankind? He doesn't do it like we're talking about, by force. He's not in there and literally holding your feet to the fire. He's in there, like we're talking about in terms of broadcasting his attitudes, these attitudes, these influences in our lives. And through that, he deceives the whole world, as we read, or as we uh, quoted before, and influences them to make these poor choices, to want to covet things that they do not have, to influence everyone else adversely. That is why the world is in the state it is in. So this set mankind on a path from the very beginning, from the creation of the very first man and woman. And so it was through this initial act that suffering entered the world. It was not a, to be a part of it. It was never the intent that man would go that way. But nonetheless, Satan was in the picture and man and woman chose poorly. And because of that, Mankind has been reaping what was sown from the very beginning. So in subsequent <coughs> chapters, the effect on human nature is realized, <coughs> continued to be realized with things like the murder of Abel and culminating quickly in God becoming so sor sorrowful that he created man that he actually destroyed the whole world with the exception of eight people. 
because they had gone so quickly out of control, submitting, as it were, coming under the influence and the sway of Satan. So, no, so knowing who Satan is and the influence that he exerts and that he is the current ruler of this world, we can now clearly see what the origin of suffering is and why the world is in the current condition that it's in. Mankind, though a willing accomplice, for the most part has been unknowingly duped into following Satan's ways and rejecting and rebelling against God's. So that being said, why then is God not intervening for everyone right now? For one, he has given man free moral agency. Acts 14, verses 15 and 16. Man is a free moral agent, as we call it. He has the ability to choose. He's been given the ability to make a choice, good or evil. Acts 14. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts of the Apostles. Acts 14, verses 15 through 16. And saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God. So put away Satan's nature, put away your human nature that's been affected adversely by Satan and turn to the living God who made the heaven, the earth and the sea and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. God has allowed nations to walk in their own ways. He has allowed man this free moral agency, as we have called it. Why is God allowing this? One of the reasons is to show us that our actions have consequences. God has set in motion inexorable spiritual laws of cause and effect. Deuteronomy 28, and we'll begin in verse 1. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1. And this is all under the heading of why is God not intervening right now? It's because he has given us choices and he wants us to understand that our actions have consequences. And he outlines this to a great detail in Deuteronomy 28. Now let's notice specifically the first verse which kind of as a foundation for our understanding of all the following verses. It says, now it shall come to pass if, okay, here's a, a conditional promise, remember? If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, so if you obey your Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, that's the way we obey God, is by keeping, doing all of his commandments, which I command you today, then we have the promise that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of earth. So we have a conditional statement for what follows. If we're going to do these things, if we're going to keep the, obeyment, the uh, commandments of God and obey God, then this is what we can look forward to. All the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. I always, you know, I love some of the uh, terminology they use that overtakes you. I mean, can you imagine so many blessings that, that just keep on coming and catching up with you that they overtake you and overcome you? You know, it's like, it'd be nice if that was the case. And it is the case a lot of times if we look at uh, how we have been blessed. Verse three, blessed shall you be in the city. 
Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flocks. God's saying that he is going to influence the growth of your business, of your livelihood, of these blessings, if you obey and keep his commandments. Verse 5. Blessed shall be your basket, your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. No matter where you are, you'll be blessed. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. There's a, you know, here. this is the word of God. This is what God is saying to us. This is what our current president says is naive to believe. He says, oh, you no. Know, that, that, that you cannot believe. We can't trust in that. We can't rely on that. That's what he says. Does it tell you what kind of president he is? This is a promise from God that if we keep these commandments, that's the condition. They shall come out against you the one way, but they'll flee from you seven ways. The Lord will bless, will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand. He will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gave you. And the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to, just as he has sworn to you, if, he repeats it again, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, if you keep them and if you do them, skipping down to verse 14, so you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day to the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. So those are those are the conditions. Those are the blessings that you can expect. But there's a flip side. Remember, we're talking about the consequence of action. We're talking about free moral agency. We're talking about learning from these things. Verse 15 says, but, it even says but, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. I mean, you look around us at the state of the world. Does it not look like the world has been cursed? It has. Notice what he says in verse 16. Cursed shall you be in the city, cursed shall you be in the country, cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl, cursed shall you be the fruit of your body, the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks, cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. Is it any doubt as to what's going to happen if you don't keep God's ways, all of it? The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hands to do until you are destroyed, until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. Verse 21, I'll, I'll just hit some of the highlight words here. You know, plague, 22, consumption, fever, inflammation, the sword, scorching, mildew, until you perish. Verse 23, your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is underneath shall be iron. A metaphor for drought and famine. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. Verse 25, cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You know, I, I've asked, you know, some of the older uh, guys that I know over at the... Uh, the coffee house I go to. And I said, you know, when was the last time that, you know, the U.S. won a war? You know, you know, they, you know, everything that we've been in since basically World War II back in the 40s has not come out well for the U.S. Not that, that we should be doing these things, but nonetheless, you know, the U.S. is not anymore this powerhouse, even though they were a, a physical people and they weren't following guys they should have. You know, God had blessed this country because of promises that he made to Abraham. But these things are being uh, withdrawn, retracted now. And look at it. You know, now what's coming? Defeat. 
before your enemies. Verse 26. Your carcasses, I mean, this is graphic, shall be food. I mean, your, your dead bodies, people, shall be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and no one shall frighten them away. And then going on, verse 27, boils, tumors, scab, itch, which you cannot be healed, madness, in verse 28, blindness and confusion. In 29, you shall not prosper in your ways. You'll be oppressed and plundered, and no one shall save you. Verse 45, moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God. This is why. Because, he's giving you the reason, you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. And they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder and on your descendants forever because you did not serve the Lord your God. Let's continue with this thought in Jeremiah 2, verses 17 through 19. So are we beginning to see why the world is in the uh, condition it's in? It's cause and effect. It's reaping what you sow. There are consequences for the actions that we take. Continuing in Jeremiah 2, verses 17. Have you not brought this on yourself? It's a consequence of what you did, the way you acted, your failure to continue in what I taught you. You know, you can read through the, you know, the beginning of the chapter 2 down to verse 17 and see what God did for them and then how they went away from that. And he says, have you not brought this on yourself and that you have forsaken the Lord your God when he led you in the way? So, you know, we end up in, with the end of uh, Deuteronomy 28, verse 47 says, because you did not serve the Lord your God. And he continues this here saying, you have forsaken the Lord, your God, when he led you in the way. He showed you. So you really are without excuse. And when we look at the fact that we have a Bible, everybody's got a Bible. It's prolific. You know, Gideon puts them in all the hotels. And you're just, you're not short for a Bible. You can get an online Bible. You can get it on your phone. So we are, in a, in a sense, have been led in the way we have the word of God right here. And so he goes on, uh, let's just skip to uh, verse 19. He says, your own wickedness will correct you. Your own wickedness will correct you. Are you seeing now why God is not intervening, why he doesn't have to intervene just yet? is because he wants us to begin to see what the effect is for the things that we do. He wants mankind as a whole, in general, to come to understand that you reap what you sow. That Satan's way leads to all the cursings, to all the problems, to all the trouble that we now have. He wants us to learn from the error of our ways. He wants that to be our instruction to correct us. And your backslidings will rebuke you. You learn from these things. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing, the things that we're doing, that you have forsaken the Lord your God. And the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. So God is hands off at the moment because he wants people to see over this time, over this 6,000 years of mankind, that their ways are not the right way. Their ways lead to suffering, to the war, the disease, the famine, the pestilence, the pain, the suffering that we're going through. 
because we have turned our back on God from the very beginning, from Adam and Eve, all the way until now, and even what's left of the future. God wants to see that there are two ways of life. Just as there were two trees, and man chose the wrong tree and continues to choose the wrong tree and the wrong way. You know, God wants us to see, like Proverbs 14, 12, and 16, 25 say, that there is a way that seems right to us. You know, and this is what mankind's been doing the last 6,000 years. You know, they're not going to be, uh, you know, without excuse. They, they, they have no excuse when they say, well, you know, if you had just given us a chance at democracy, at communism, fascism, dictatorships, if you would just let us have a commune or just do, you know, things on our own, you know, then, yeah, that way would have worked. We could have worked it out. But no, it's not because our ways are not God's ways. This is what he wants us to realize. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. His ways are you know, higher than the, the heavens are above the earth. His ways are above our ways. And you know, we have this carnal mind, and it's at odds with God. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, like Romans 8, 7 says. But because man has not chosen this tree of life, he does not have the Spirit of God. And he chooses to do what he does based on these selfish motives, satanic, demonic motives, or influences, because of these poor choices. God wants us to choose wisely. Let's turn over uh, back to Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 15. And of course, this is two chapters after the blessings and cursings chapters, after he said, okay, here are all the things I want you to do. And of course, also in Deuteronomy, he gave this, you have the uh, second giving of the, the commandments. I mean, that's what Deuteronomy means, in fact. Second law. But in Deuteronomy 30, in verse 15, see, look here now. I've set before you today life and good, death and evil. He's given them a choice. But what has man chosen? He's chosen the wrong way the way that leads to suffering. And whenever God said, you will surely die, and Satan says, no, you won't, who do you think was right? You know, the way that man chose did lead to death and continues to lead to death. Whether it's your first physical death or a second eternal death, Satan's ways are not, you know, they're, they're further than east is from the west in terms of from God's ways. So I've set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But... Verse 17, if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, whatever the gods are, whatever you put in front of the one and only true God, those are your gods, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish, that you shall surely die, just as he told Adam and Eve. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And what does God want? Look what he says. Therefore, choose life. That is what he wants for us that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him. 
for he is your life and length of days. He's the only one that has that ability and power to do that. Satan, his ability and power is to try to take it away. And we know in the end that he's going to fail if we follow the word of God. And that you may dwell in the land which the Lord, your, Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. This is what God wants for us. He doesn't want us to make the wrong choice. But he also does want us to learn from our wrong choices, from our wrong actions. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. God would rather we obey than have to sacrifice anything, that we have to endure any type of cursings for our sins. He just wants us to obey. 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. So is that what he would rather? Would he rather these burnt offerings and sacrifices? When they had to do a burnt offering, they had to take something from their own flock and sacrifice it and give it up. Is that what he wants? Or would he rather you just obey the voice of the Lord? Behold, he answers him, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and, iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king in this situation. But you can just as easily put, he has rejected you from what? From being a part of him, from being a part of his family, from the one the true way you have to fall in line you have to obey and that's what he wants he wants you to choose wisely the problem is that what has happened from the beginning throughout the relatively short history of mankind will continue to happen into the future man will continue to choose poorly for all the reasons that we've enumerated and the fact that satan is alive and well so is god really in charge then Yes. Emphatically, yes. He's specifically in control of Satan, the main culprit in mankind's suffering. Let's notice Revelation 13. Satan is the dragon who gives his power and authority to the beast. But let's notice by what mechanism he is able to do this. Revelation 13, verse 4. For context. Revelation 13, Verses 4, and we'll read 7 as well after it. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. They worshipped the devil, Satan, whether, and this, in most cases, unknowingly. They worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. He empowered the beast to come. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? There is nobody like the beast. Who is able to make war with him? He's so powerful and strong. And Satan's the one that's given him that power. But notice verse 7, that it was granted to him, that is to Satan the devil, to make war with the saints and to the beast, to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Satan can only do what God allows him to do. So in effect, God is intervening in mankind. He's not letting Satan have his complete and unadulterated way with mankind. If that were going to be the case, Satan would obliterate, I mean, literally wipe out mankind so as to thwart the plan of God and what God has in store for mankind. Satan is still subject to God, who is much more powerful than the devil. And God is still in complete control. <laughs> God has his plan that he is working out here below. He's not intervening now in the most minute of ways, though we can see that he is limiting what Satan is doing and can do. But he is going to later definitely intervene even more so, just as we would expect a fair 
merciful and compassionate God to do. Let's make no mistake about it. God is in charge, but he is allowing Satan to rule this world until, until Christ returns. Christ, who's already qualified to replace Satan, till he returns to establish his kingdom here on earth. God made the decision not to intervene in general in the affairs of this world in order to teach man the lesson that without God, man is incapable of ever living happily and peaceably by themselves or even together. When Christ returns, he will intervene in the affairs of mankind. He'll put an end to the wars, to hunger, to sickness, disease that have come upon this world through Satan's influence, through the poor choices of mankind, through his lack of contentment, because of the cursings that are inexorably in motion because of man's disobedience to God. And he'll once again make the Holy Spirit available freely to all mankind and will enable man to have the mind or have access to the mind of God and how to live a better way. When this happens, we will truly see suffering begin to come to an end. And ultimately, it will be wiped away completely. Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And, verse 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. God will intervene in his time. So what a wonderful time we have to look forward to when everyone will not only understand the mind of God and his perfect ways, but everyone will have the mind of God and be living in absolute peace and harmony.